Shabbat Shalom, my friends. Welcome to our ongoing conversations about the weekly Torah portion, sometimes called the Parsha, but uh, more accurately called the Parasha, sometimes called the Sedra, but Sedra, Parasha, Parsha, all mean the very same thing, the weekly Torah portion. And this week we are looking at Kitavo, beginning with Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 1. Well, Labor Day is past. Private schools, public schools have reopened, and this past Wednesday evening, the moon was magnificently full. On that evening, Risa and I had been visiting a friend who was unfortunately very seriously ill in the hospital. As we headed back to our car after our visit, we glanced upward. We could not tear our eyes away from nature's sublime artistry, from the glory, from the splendor, of the sweep of the heavens. That full moon embraced us with all of its reflected glory. Certainly those few rabbis left who are still laboring over their high holiday sermons, fine-tuning them, are well aware that the presence of that full moon on Wednesday evening was a clear indication that the high holidays are within two weeks of making their appearance and the new year 5778 will very quickly be here. I was born in 5700, the number 5778 seems to have a message for me. But there's more. Looking at that moon, we could not help but find that our hearts were drawn to Houston and to many other parts of Texas, where the nightmarish destruction of Harvey is only now beginning to become really clear. And to Florida and the eastern seaboard, Irma, Irma's coming. I I don't know, the the winds are 165, 185 miles an hour, threatening enormous destruction, death, pain, suffering. It will not be an easy weekend and early next week for those people. Look at what the heavens bring. Blessings and the promises found in in that moon, full moon, telling us about good things to come and curses that threaten to tear apart our homes, our lives, everything we've dreamt about, all that we have built. Both the blessings and the curses, the moon, the pleasure, the joy, the coming of the new year, the destruction flowing from the heavens, gifts of non-conscious forces far beyond our control, the origins of which are not much more comprehended by most of us today than Job in his day could understand why winds blow strong and why snow falls. Those of you who have been studying with me somewhat regularly over these past few months know that I find certain aspects of Zoroastrianism fascinating, especially when we read of the eternal struggle between those forces which yield good and those forces which yield evil. I have the same kind of attraction to Taoism. Now, you know the major symbol of Taoism, the yin-yang symbol. The yin is that dark swirl associated with the shadows. The yang is the light swirl associated with brightness and growth, hope. And in the yin, the dark, is a white seed. In the yang, the light is a dark seed. In darkness, the promise of light abides. In lightness, the threat of darkness abides. Quite a symbol. Life and death, good and evil, love and hate, hope and dread, rage and joy, stasis and change, advance, retreat, the unfathomable, polarities of human existence. Our sedra is the locus classicus of polarities, of blessings and curses. For example, cursed be those who make idols, cursed be those who insult their parents, cursed be those who misdirect a blind person, cursed be whoever will not uphold the terms of this Torah, uphold them so as to observe them, blessed. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be 
you be in your comings and blessed shall be in your goings. The eternal God will make you the heads and never the tail. You will always be at the top and never at the beginning. If only you obey and faithfully observe the mitzvot of the eternal, your God. The author of Deuteronomy insists that there is a direct causal relationship between our behavior, the choices we make, and our existential condition, the lives that we are actually living. If there is darkness at noon, if storms destroy all that we have built, if we are thrust into exile, if illness robs us of all those whom we so profoundly love, if our sight dims and strength ebbs away, it is because we have fallen short. But if the sun rises so as to encourage the fields to yield a rich harvest, if we live to a ripe old age, hugging children and grandchildren, God willing, even great-grandchildren to our chest, to our hearts, if our businesses prosper, if our sight and our hearing, I take that personally, never fade, it is because we have been faithful to God and faithful to God's Torah. When I was a kid... Who so many decades ago, we had a toy. It was a stuffed animal that made to resemble a llama with two heads connected with one body. Two heads, body. We called that toy, I think, what? Do you remember? A push-me-pull-you, whatever it was. A push-me-pull-you. Zoroastrians and Taoists acknowledge that dualism in life and seem to teach that along with that dualism, there are forces at play in the universe that are beyond our capacity to control. At times, life heads in one direction. At times, it heads in another direction. Our human challenge is how to deal with the realities as we confront and encounter them, but not to change the way the universe works because that is totally beyond our grasp. Not so in Judaism. Judaism teaches that all of nature, the universe, all of human existence, everything is somehow reflective of our behavior, of the choices we make. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were given control over all the earth. Custody. If we fail to be good stewards of the earth, then the earth itself will turn against us. But if the skies grow leaden and no rain falls, if our fields yield no produce, if our marriages find no love and no future, if our diseases refuse to yield to our attempts to cure, if our children fail to respect us, if our enemies overwhelm us and drive us into exile from out of the promised land, the fault lies not with unknown and unknowable forces. The fault, according to Deuteronomy, and agreed to in the main by the rabbis, lies with us. If we accept that ours is not to change the essential nature of a polarized world, a world in which good and evil seem to take turns at impacting our destiny without regard for who we are, without regard for the fact that we even exist. If we accept that in a push-me-pull-you world, we are mainly expected to be reactive to the situations which confront us and not to tra change our destiny, then I think the human burden, human burden is not all that heavy. But our center refuses to see it that way. Yes, the Deuteronomic perspective in some ways go, goes far overboard in the opposite direction, seeing everything locked in a very mecha a mechanistic way. All that is good happens when we are faithful to God. All that bad happens because we have not been faithful, period. Okay, if we could move past that extreme, and the rabbis, Middle Ages, move past that extreme. Who we are and what we do actually matters in the world. 
The message is that our choices count. Our acts of goodness are transformative. Our sins corrupt and corrode everything that we touch. Our efforts toward tshuva, to pull back from that corrosion and corruption, resets the moral balance. In a polarized universe, according to Jewish teachings, we tiny specks that we are. We matter. We really do matter. Okay, not as much as we would like to matter. The universe doesn't center on us. But we matter far more than some of us might have been led to believe. Who are we then as we begin to approach Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? Who are we? The rabbis make it clear. We are nothing but dust and ashes. We are destined to be consumed by worms. That's who are we. Who are we, say the rabbis? We are little lower than the angels. We are dust and ashes. We are little lower than the angels. And the choice is always ours. We are partners with infinity, infinity with a capital I. Our choices matter. Our dreams matter. Our deeds matter. We, no matter how helpless and limited we feel, we matter. That's not a bad message to bear in mind as the moon reminds us that we are growing closer and closer to Rosh Hashanah in the days of awe. Keep these thoughts in mind, my friends. Have a wonderful Shabbat. And shamelessly, I ask you to please share this message with your friends. Let them join in the conversation. See you next week. May your preparations for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur bring you a feeling of transcendence and of hope. Shabbat Shalom.